My name is, uh, is Dr. Kate Devlin, and for those of you who are here for the first time, Virtual Futures first occurred at the University of Warwick during the mid-90s, and it arose as a tipping point in the technologization, did I say that right, Luke? Technolo technologization uh, of first world cultures. Whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positive festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, I haven't drunk the wine yet, so I can say that in one go. The Glastonbury of cyber culture, as the Guardian put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brushed steel and silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs, the charismatic prophets and the techno parties ooh, was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage with emerging scientific theory and technological development. This Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So let's begin. The past few years have seen a cascade of headlines about sex robots. Uh, these have ranged from the melancholic, seedy, sordid, but mainly just sad, to quote The Guardian, to the outraged, sex robots could reveal your secret perversions, thank you Daily Mail, and the fearful, sex robots may literally fuck us to death, that was from Gizmodo. <laughs> By and large, the headlines are dystopian. And additionally, the overwhelming, overwhelming majority of them assume that a sexual companion robot will take a lifelike robot form, usually female. I've watched this subject area grow from its early days as a subject often dismissed as trivial and unworthy of academic practice through the race to deliver the first commercially available version and the ethical discussions that that raises. And I've been on the receiving end of more than a few raised eyebrows when I've told people that this is what I research. But fortunately, there are many of us who consider it worth considering. And John Danaher and Neil MacArthur's 2017 edit edited collection, Robot Sex, Ta -da. Um, is an excellent, clear, and really thorough debate on the social and ethical implications of sex with robots. And I'm delighted to be able to spend the next hour discussing the issues raised in it. So please welcome Dr. John Danaher. Thank you. John, I'm going to begin with the question that everyone asks, what got you into sex robots? Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, the uninteresting answer is that I was asked to contribute to a collection about technological unemployment and the basic income guarantee a few years ago by a guy called James Hughes, who's the head of the Institute of Ethics and Emerging Technologies in the US. And uh, I originally wasn't particularly interested in it, but then I decided that I might be interested in it if I could take a different angle on the whole debate about technological unemployment, because most discussions of that focus on what I would call mainstream legal forms of, of work, and I thought it would be interesting to look at sex work as a kind of black market or um, socially taboo form of labor and how that might be affected by technological unemployment, and uh, I decided to craft an argument about that. So David Levy, who's one of the pioneers in the field of uh, love and sex with robots, that's the title of his book back in 2007, argues that sex workers will be subject to the same kinds of displacement as you know, automotive workers are in uh, car factories. And I was arguing against that view. Because I, yeah, I just suggested that sex work might be something that's relatively more resi resistant or resilient to. And I'd like to talk a bit more about that later on, actually. But just to start us off then, what exactly are we talking about when we talk about sex robots? Yeah, well, actually, this is probably something you have <laughs> more developed views on than I have, since you're the uh, computer scientist or roboticist. Um, a robot, I guess, loose definition would be an embodied artificial agent and a sex robot would be a robot that is either used or intended for use for sexual purposes. I think in, in your book you were you start with an assertion because you have to start somewhere mm. to define it. You were saying it's it's a robot, it's embodied, but it might not be embodied and all it could be virtual and it, yes. it's most likely human like didn't have to be human-like. Is that something? That yeah. So I mean, I in the book we focus largely on human likeness, uh, and because we think that raises the most interesting social and ethical issues. So we say that there's a three-part <laughs> definition that a sex robot is a robot that's intended for sexual purposes that has human-like appearance, human-like movement, and some degree of artificial intelligence. That could be very limited and basic. It could be just you know pre-programmed script-like responses to uh, some stimuli or in input. 
but or something more advanced like some sophisticated machine learning algorithm that adapts to your preferences and your past behaviors. But we yeah we think human likeness is the um, kind of key dimension for social and ethical implications for looking at those. But you know to be honest, you could debate me on that or dispute that. Well, yeah, because <laughs> um, yeah, like, well actually I know you will because. <laughs> You've specifically argued that we shouldn't um, adopt a kind of humanoid or anthropocentric view of, of sex robots. But um, there are also, you know, if you want to go in this direction, animal-likeness could be interesting because actually there are <coughs> animal-like sex toys in the world. It's often a way of avoiding uh, regulation or prohibitions on human-like sex toys. Uh, so, the, you know, there are other questions. And also then the distinction between something that is embodied versus something that's virtual. In the book, I say that it doesn't really matter so much. What matters is the degree of human likeness of the interaction. And that's that's really interesting thing. So for, for those of you who don't closely follow the development of sex robots, um, I know you clearly all do. Um, so what there currently is, um, it's pretty limited. There are no commercially available off-the-shelf products to buy. Uh, there are prototypes that have just emerged in the last year. The closest anyone has got is Abyss Creations, who make Real Doll. And they've built a sex robot called Harmony, who is one of their dolls with an animatronic head and an AI personality. The AI personality can stand alone, so you can have it on a tablet or on your phone and converse with it. It's essentially a, a more, sort of more sophisticated chatbot. Um, the uh, robot itself... It can't support itself. It can't move its body. You have to position it. It won't stand upright on its own without support. Um, but it can move its head, blink, smile, and has a soft Scottish accent that sounds really strange coming from this very pornified, hypersexualized figure. So there are other people making sex robots. There's some uh, factories in China. There was, so we've got different types. We've got the sort of workshop ones, the garage builders like... Um, Sergio Santos, who's built his robot, Samantha. Um, and then we have the sort of crafted higher end ones for Real Doll Do, which are about $10,000 upwards when they go on sale. And they're a waiting list. And the reason that uh, Real Doll make them is they said that the one thing that their doll owners want is an extra layer of interactivity. And the emphasis is quite strongly on companionship. So there has been this community of doll owners for some time. Um, in my own view is that this is kind of the, the idea of getting sex robots out of this is still going to make it quite a niche area. Do you think it's a niche area? Or do you think it has wider, wider appeal? Yeah, I mean, I kind of go back and forth in this. I mean, if you look at um, surveys that have been done a few years ago, there were very few people thought they wanted to have sex with a robot. There was a um, survey done by, I think it was Huffington Post that suggested about 10% of people. But actually, more recent surveys have looked at an increase that certainly people would be more willing to entertain the possibility. I think a lot of it's going to depend on how normalized relationships with robots become in our society. Um, Julie Carpenter, who's a chapter in this book, talks about this, about the robot accommodation process. So like, there's a long-standing view that people will be creeped out or weirded out by intimate relationships with robots. Um, Masahiro Moti, is that yeah. his name? Mori. Mori, sorry, yeah. back in the 1970s, uh, coined this idea of the uncanny valley, that the more human-like a robot becomes, the creepier it becomes until it can effectively pass as a human being. And we are nowhere near that yet. <laughs> no, we're, we're nowhere near that. But uh, Julie kind of pushes back against that idea because ultimately the Uncanny Valley hypothesis was just a hypothesis. It, wasn't, yeah. it didn't have any data behind it. There's been some studies in more recent times which suggest that it's a, a more... Um, it's, pr it's prevalent, but it's not guaranteed, I think, isn't it? Yeah, there, there, there are various modalities and, that, yeah. that you can change that affect it. So, I mean, her view is that culture will play a big role in normalizing intimate relationships with robots, and that will be the key determining factor when it comes to how acceptable or niche this area is. But at the moment, I suspect it's very niche. Um, we are primed to consider our sex robots to be in a certain form, from sci-fi, from films. Um, we have, uh, from, from right back to um, Greek legend, Greek myth, we have this idea of the, the perfect, usually woman. Um, who, it's Pygmalion the, idea. Yeah, well, even, even the, and Pygmalion is kind of the key one that gets said a lot. You know, you've got this beautiful sculpted statue that is brought to life um, as an artificial, as, as a, a artificial lover become real. And there are even earlier stories as well. And um, so we're kind of primed to expect that if we have 
an artificial lover it will be in that form of the beautiful partner um i, I could also add that you know technology and sex have always been fairly closely connected oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we've always used technology for sexual purposes yes absolutely so we have the earliest examples of sex toys are uh, go back 30,000 years um, we don't necessarily know they were sex toys they are um, phallic objects found um, possibly religious possibly ridges, religious yeah. archaeologists like to be a bit Bit, bit hesitant about classing them as sex toys. I used to be an archaeologist, so. Um, um, well, yeah, well I think the past use of them is unrecoverable in yeah, certain ways. We don't know if they were actually know. used. To. We know one of them was used as a hammer stone, so uh, that might be a bit painful. Um, but yeah, we, we we know that. But we know from at least um, records from the Greeks onwards that the dildos were being used. There's records from the Middle Ages in Europe that um, forbids that provides. Um, penance and punishment for the use of sex toys specifically for sex so we we know that that's always been around and then we know that technology has influenced or, or rather sex has influenced our technology because technology seems to be developed around the themes of military or sex so porn or war tend to be big drivers in technological change so, well i mean i think you know a lot of people say that porn has played a key role in the development of the internet i'm I'm not entirely sure about that, but I also think that um, we, we overlook the way in which sex technology is going to be influenced by other technological developments. So I think this is particularly true in when it comes to sex robots, that people look at the current set of prototypes and they say, well, these are very crude, unsophisticated devices, you know, very limited repertoire of behaviors and um, personality types. But I think it's actually more interesting to look at other developments in robotics, more human-like movement, if you look at things like Boston Dynamics. Imagine if Boston Dynamics made sex robots. It's yeah. quite terrifying. Yes, yes. yes. it'll do a backflip. <laughs> yeah, so if you look at those other developments, I think eventually they will converge on yeah. sex robots. And that, that's what strikes me as a more compelling argument when it comes to taking this seriously. I, I would agree with you because I think the, the sex doll niche is, is, is pretty narrow. But if you think about robots coming into our lives more and more, and especially companion robots and things like that, rather than having a specifically built sex robot, you have a robot that also can serve a sexual function, perhaps that it becomes not a thing in its own right, but perhaps something that's added on to something else. Yeah, I think the notion of a single use sex robot is probably misleading. It's yeah. more likely that we'll have multi-use robot, companion robots. robots. Yeah. yeah, which are in development. Um, without the sexual purpose um, in various stages of development. Um, What's interesting to me as well is how some makers of those robots, such as um, SoftBank, the Japanese company, try to specifically outlaw the use of them for sexual purposes. They say, well, yeah. these are not to be used for sexual purposes. If you have sex with SoftBank's robot Pepper, you void the warranty. Uh, it actually says in the terms and conditions, you know, do not have, do not use Pepper for, I think it's like sexual purposes or fraternizing with the opposite sex and things like this. Although what fascinates me about that is I'm not sure how someone could have sex with <laughs> Pepper, but... <laughs> Maybe my imagination is, is limited. Or, or Depends on our definition of sex, I think. Yeah, well, about, that, yeah. we'll get on to that in a second, actually. Or or why some, they need to put that clause in. That's the other thing. Um, well, actually, yes, let's let's talk about that because um, the book, there's um, this is addressed in the book, um, not by you, but in one of the other chapters, about what what do we call sex anyway? Is it is it something that has to involve more than one person? It does masturbation count as sex? Or does it have to be a an act that's reciprocal. And I think this this is interesting because this will get us onto the, the people who have objections around this stuff, um, who do object on the terms that it's not a proper relationship of any sort. But So the, the, the discussion in the book is around it being a more reciprocal act, mm. but not necessarily penis and vagina, not necessarily to the point of orgasm, but some kind of enacted behavior that involves two people or more, multiplayer. Yeah, I think I would like to just back up for a moment and, and ask like whether the definitional question of what is sex is an interesting one. Uh, this is a very philosophical topic. Uh, it, many people dismiss it and say that it's not interesting and that focusing too much on technical or anatomical definitions is problematic, even though we use that a lot in legal definitions of, of sexual assault and rape. Um, and the, one reason for thinking that it's worth taking seriously is because it is important to people to know whether they have had sex with somebody. It's culturally important for better or worse reasons because the idea of like, virginity is treated as being important in some in some cultures. But it's also just, I think, important for a lot of people to know whether the activity in, in which they engage is, is sexual or is counts as having sex. Now, the definition in the book, so the authors that you're referring to, Mark McGoaty and Nicole Wyatt, they... Uh, 
defend a very reciprocal, mutual uh, definition or understanding of sex, that it's a, um, kind of sh an act of shared agency. It's two people or more working together towards some common purpose, some common sexual purpose. And I mean, this is one reason why they think it's impossible to have sex with a robot, because they don't think that a robot can satisfy the mutuality or reciprocity conditions there. And this is a very common theme in the book because it crops up over and over again as, a, as whether you can have a, a loving relationship or a meaningful relationship with a robot. Um, and so they end up with the position that has been described by the comedian Richard Herring as the fact that um, so, you know, having sex with a robot is ju it's really just having an elaborate wank. It's a very male, masculinized definition, but that's the way he, he describes it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult one. I, I, my own work... I go from the biological, neurobiological, sort of what is the arousal and can you, is it in that kind of neurotransmitters and hormones that are sort of flooding your brain and making you feel aroused and any kind of act that leads to that. But then I, I see the philosophical approach, which is very much about what does it mean to have that agency? What does it mean? And it, it's, it is really quite complicated. There's no one way of pinning this down. Um, and of course, this has implications in terms of the, um, the questions around, you know, is someone cheating with a robot if they have sex with a robot? Is it, you know, is it, is that some way of uh, just breaking, damaging to a relationship? So there is opposition to sex robots, and there are varying degrees of it. Um, I think we each have our concerns. Uh, you and I both have concerns about it. Um, there's been a campaign against sex robots um, that was set up initially saying that it was. It would be wise to ban them, but then kind of a little bit of backpedaling to say that ethical development would be better. But um, I was wondering, you, you've got a, a very nice discussion of that in the book. I was wondering if you'd like to talk about that a bit. Yeah, so the campaign against sex robots was launched in 2015 by Kathleen Richardson and somebody else, Eric Skovda. I don't know if he... Eric. Billing, sorry, from Skovda University. Yeah, and he... I don't know if he's still involved in it in any way, yeah. It's it's not anymore. Yeah, it's just Kathleen Richardson from De Montfort University in, in Leicester. Um... So we have a chapter which takes apart her, cam her argument for the campaign against sex robots. And, you know, part of our argument there is just that it's not very clear what the objectives of the campaign are. And certainly initially it wasn't very clear. So we accused the uh, campaign of committing what in philosophy is known as the, the Mott and Bailey fallacy, a very obscure reference to a um, medieval defensive structure where you have a tower that's more secure and then a village in a behind a fence. The idea is that uh, in their initial presentations they were defending it seemed an outright ban but then when challenged or pushed on that they retreated to the more sensible or defensible position that we should have as uh, you know think about the ethical implications or consequences of this and one of our objections is that well most of the people who write about this aren't immune to or ignoring those ethical yeah. consequences. The more substantive point then is like, what's the core argument that they have against sex robots? What's, what's the issue? And <coughs> Kathleen Richardson herself has a very Marxist view, I would say, Marxist feminist style views. So her concern is about um, the prevalence of commodified property style relationships with other human beings and also with ourselves. And she views sex robots as kind of the apotheosis or ultimate expression of this property and commodified understanding of our interactions with other uh, beings. And she bases a lot of her arguments on an analogy between the interactions that humans would have with sex robots and the interactions that sex workers have with their clients, although she refers to this as the, the prostitute John relationship. So it's a highly kind of gendered conception of, of sex work, which some people agree with and some people think is problematic. And she's very insistent upon using the word prostitute as opposed to sex worker as well, because she thinks it um, doesn't legitimize the practice. So, so looking at some empirical work that's been done on prostitute John interactions, she reports um, interview statements of people who frequent prostitutes, describing them as just, you know, uh, another person that they use for a particular end, um, that they don't care about their feelings, they have no concern for their well-being or status. It's all about their needs and their desires. And the concern was that that will carry over or port over into 
our interactions with sex robots, which will in turn have terrible consequences for our relationships with other human beings more generally. So it, I've described this in as a symbolic consequences argument, so that it, there's a concern with the symbolism of the interaction between a human and a sex robot, that it symbolizes the kind of interaction that you have between a, a client and a sex worker, and then that it has terrible consequences down the line because it encourages this objectified, commodified style of, of relationship. So, I mean, that's the objection that they have to um, sex robots. Yeah. And there's also there's the aspect of, sort of the form that these robots currently take is very hypersexualized female caricature almost, and to which I actually agree that I think that is, is a damaging um, objectification of women. I'm, I'm a strong advocate for moving away from that. Um, but I mean, the research that I've done has shown that the people who currently own sex dolls are actually by and large incredibly respectful in the relationships of them. Um, there are people who are, get, who are buying these dolls and interacting with them on a daily basis um, for companionship. There's the aspects, there are other people who are fetishizing them, so it does become part of a sexual practice. Um, but I think, yes, there, there, is, there is disagreement over whether or not this will lead to enhanced, increased sexual violence in the real world if it is enacted upon a machine. And we saw the same arguments around computer video games and violence, which has not seen a corresponding rise in violence at all in the real world. Yeah, and so the, the argument has that, that structure that I described. I mean, whether it's credible is uh, another question. So a few concerns about it in the book. One is that it, it's not necessarily true what the claims made about prostitute John relationships are not necessarily true. They're highly disputed in the literature. You know, Kathleen Richardson quotes from a, one study, but if you look at a more diverse range of studies, you find that the kinds of interactions between sex workers and clients can be more nuanced and more reciprocal and more respectful, kind of backing up the point you're making about the interactions between a user of a sex doll and, uh, or a sex robot and, and the sex ro robot itself. There's also the concern about whether the consequent, it has this spillover effect, this kind of downstream consequential effect. And I don't look at the debate about computer games and violence, but I do look at the debates about hardcore pornography historically, which is, I think, a, maybe a closer analogy. And it, one of the points that I make in the book is that it's just, it's not very clear what the consequences of wide availability of hardcore porn are. Um, lots of studies have been done. One of the studies that I quote in the book is a review of all the different studies that have been done. It says there's about 40,000 papers published since 1975 on the empirical effects of pornography. There could be some duplications in that. Uh, so even eliminating those and eliminating the lower quality studies, you're left with a few thousand. And there's a mixed range of outcomes there. Some find a very strong negative effect. Some find actually a positive effect. Some find no effect at all. It is really a matter if you can pick out what you want to use for the study. There's yeah, but I, I think that's, that's not surprising because, number one, researchers in this area tend to have fairly strong ideological commitments or pre-commitments um, here, or they've developed those over time. And also that like, when it comes to a behavior like, let's say, sexual aggression or sexual violence, it's likely that that is multifactorial. And so find, assuming there's going to be a clear and direct linear relationship between exposure to pornography and the real world sexual violence or sexual aggression, I think it's problematic. It's likely to be affected by many factors. So even if it's true that exposure to hard por hardcore pornography has a negative effect, there are lots of other things happening in society that might have a net positive effect. So I, I think the same is going to be true, by the way, of the debate about sex robots. I think it's highly unlikely that we will actually get a clear consequential understanding of, of the, the harms or benefits of this technology. It's almost like it's nuanced. <laughs> it's nuanced, yeah. Um, I think one of the things that the availability of porn online has increased massively in the past few years even. Um, and we don't see a corresponding increase in enacted sexual violence, but we do see changes in behavior, sexual behavior and practice. Possibly, so uh, there's it, it's re but it is really tricky to unpick. I don't think it is something that's easily unpicked. Um, so there are 
that's one aspect. The other, the other opposition that often comes up is the child sex robot mm. thing. And this is something you've written about extensively before. You've done another paper on it, haven't you? I ha yes, I have. Um, and there's another paper in the book, in which the is not written about me, by me, which argues against and argues for criminal legal prohibitions on child sex robots. I think, I mean, I think I agree with that notion that there there's, doesn't seem to be very strong reasons to favor the creation of such um, de devices. It's already the case that such objects are subject to criminal prohibition. Virtual child pornography yeah. is criminalized. But the importation of child sex dolls into this country is criminalized and somebody has been convicted for yes, that. Yes, there's been a few now. They've cracked down last year. There was an operation that cracked down yeah. on the import of childlike sex dolls. And I think there's actually maybe three or four people now that have been convicted. But ownership is not illegal, but the importation is just the saying, Yeah, so they're, illegal. they're using an... A, archaic law to archaic right law that, about yeah. the importation of an obscene object to um, prosecute people in this area and yet computer generated child abuse images are completely illegal it's illegal to make or, or to, to share um, yeah that varies from country to country but, but it, yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, in the UK in the yeah. UK it is and in many European countries yeah. it is in the US it's not there was actually a yeah. Supreme Court case about it in the early 2000s that it's uh, subject to free speech um, restrictions although I think there was a law Somebody was trying to introduce a law, a senator called Dan Donovan before Christmas, Noel Sharkey, who's one of the other figures that entered this debate, told me about it. I don't know if it's passed or if it'll succeed in passing. It probably won't. But um, yeah, there is opposition to that. So I mean, one reason why I think that there isn't, it's probably wise to maintain that status quo is because I don't know if there's a very strong therapeutic case for the use of, of child sex robots as, as some kind of way of weaning people off yeah, I mean, I'm inclined to agree with you. I mean, the work that's been done by University of Montreal on rehabilitation of sex offenders in virtual environments, this is one of the ways they were able to look at using virtual reality um, because initially when they were testing if sex offenders were rehabilitated, they would uh, show people images to see whether or not they responded to them. Um, of course, that's not ethical. You can't do that. You can't show people abusive images. So they moved on to audio transcripts of people reading out descriptions of the images that doesn't have necessarily the same effect. So then they moved on to virtual characters and found that they could detect if someone was aroused after rehabilitation in that environment. So there, there could potentially be a, a logical argument made to say, well, then you could use these in that kind of situation. But I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think this is something that needs very close scrutiny. Um, and but, uh, possibly not mm. something that you should, that, that is necessarily encouraged. Yeah, I attended a conference before Christmas about this in Potsdam, and there was a fairly well-known institute of sexology in Berlin, and there was a representative of them, and he said, like, the mainstream view amongst uh, therapists when it comes to treating those with pedophilic tendencies is uh, to encourage them not to express the desire, and he doesn't see any reason to think that this would be a, a kind of a positive step when it comes to therapy. That said, there were people at that conference who were interested in the idea of exploring this and possibly researching it. But one of the things that was discussed in detail was it's, it seems unlikely that you would get any funding to do this. And I mean, good luck to you if you want to try and get a government to fund research into that area. Yeah, I mean, it's hard enough getting research into this area without yeah. the, that aspect of it. Um, I think the that... In terms of um, offenders, this, uh, on an unrelated note to the child sex robots, I've heard people say perhaps this is an argument for having things like sex robots or sex dolls in prisons um, as a form of, well, companionship and sex for people who are incarcerated. Um, do you think that's a, a possible thing to do, use for them? Um, I mean, that, that's an argument that Neil MacArthur makes in the book. Uh, he's the co-editor, so... Um, I don't You're know. here to talk for him. I'm, I'm going to speak for him. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, he, he thinks that it could be a, a benefit of this technology. I, I, like, I don't have any intrinsic objection to it, but I do think that it's from a policy perspective, and I often think in terms of how practical or realistic these, thing, these policies are, I suspect there's going to be a huge amount of opposition to it. I mean, it's hard enough to get other basic rights for prisoners. The notion of supplying them with sex dolls or sex robots seems like it wouldn't work out. I mean, there's no political capital in, in this idea. I can't imagine a politician mooting it. So in terms of the law, I mean, there's a lot of talk. One of the stories that 
hits the headlines a lot is the uh, is the Roxy True Companion robot, which is actually pretty much vaporware, uh, doesn't exist. Mm. The person who claims to have made this robot is a bit of a charlatan. Um, and but he clearly did have some. Kind he has, of he had a, he has a, a trade show model, um, and he takes a lot of money off people promising them <laughs> sex robots and doesn't deliver. Um, because who's going to ask for their money back um, I guess he's extremely litigious so uh, you should be cautious I, 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 about I, these I, comments he alleged he has not delivered any <laughs> of these robots um, so yeah anyway I was, one of the things he is um, has been in the press for is that he had different settings for his robot and said that one of them was this frigid fire setting so that you could have a doll that would put up a, an objection to you having sex and of course there's a lot of a lot of reaction saying well this is this is rape um, well of course you cannot rape a robot legally. This is not a person. This is not. But the, obviously the knock-on worry is that that would encourage it in real life. Again, your sort of argument that came around with this, the campaign against sex robots. So, I mean, do, do you think that this is, a, is, is there some mileage in this idea? Yes, I wrote an entire paper arguing that there was some mileage in the idea. Um, yeah, like I have a lot to say on that topic, some of it just anecdotal and maybe of peripheral interest. But uh, Laura Bates wrote a, an op-ed in the New York Times during the summer about this and talked about, so the setting on True Companion Frigid Farah was the name of the personality type. So the, the alleged personality types that came with this alleged possibly non-existent device. Um, they may or may not be in manufacture. <laughs> they, they, they all had the, like, these really problematic gendered personality types. Like Wild Wendy was one of them. Um, Frigid Farah. I can't remember all the rest of them, but Young Yoko, no, I think, was the name. Yeah, so, so there are all these uh, examples. And the description on the website of Frigid Farah was that if you made some advance towards her, she would not be appreciative of the gesture. That's all it said. So I wrote a paper four years ago, maybe you know, at least four years ago, closer to uh, five years at this stage, arguing that, well, that could be a way of um, symbolizing a rape and could encourage rape fantasies towards this device. And I thought there were some potential concerns about that, similar to the kind of concerns that people would have about child sex robots. Um, this was reported in a... Uh, kind of review done by the Foundation for Responsible Robotics during the summer and was picked up by Laura Bates in this op-ed. And at the time, I felt a little bit aggrieved insofar. It was, it was, her op-ed was basically the argument that I had in my paper from 2014 without any reference or mention of my work. But then I subsequently learned that Douglas Hines from True Companion had sent letters through his lawyer to everyone who had republished that story, arguing that this was a misrepresentation of his technology. Unfortunately, he never sent me a letter, so maybe I should be <laughs> should be thankful for the fact that um, I didn't get caught up in that debate. But but that said, I think there is a, an important question here about whether um, robots could be used to recreate or facilitate rape fantasies. Now, your question about you cannot rape a robot, that might be true. Legally. Legally. <laughs> Legally, you, you... Well, so there might be one context in which you can rape a robot insofar as... Um, there are such things in law as attempted offences, and you can attempt an offence even if you, um, even if it wasn't physically possible for you to perform that offence. So, that, for example, some people have been convicted of attempted drug dealing because they had some kind of vegetable matter that they thought were drugs that they were carrying around in their persons. So, if you actually thought the robot was real, you could potentially be convicted of an attempted rape of a robot. So, but that that's, I guess, highly unlikely to happen, but it is a, in principle, possibility. So you can't legally rape a robot, but I think there are nevertheless interesting questions about uh, a robot that signals non-consent and that encourages this fantasy. So it might be an actual rape, but it might be some other type of offense or some other legal category that's applied to it. Yeah. Okay. And yet... So you, I just want to say one thing, right? though, is that some people think that, like... All sexual interactions with robots are a kind of rape fantasy um, because they're because they're incapable of mutuality and consent um, and because you will always be able to manipulate them according to your own preferences that it like every interaction is necessarily a form of rape so Sinziana Gutiu, who wrote an article about this a few years ago I think it's called sex robots or the roboticization of consent makes that point 
Other people think that maybe just if it, if it signals resistance to sex, that, that it encourages a kind of rape fantasy. And yet, if you consider things like sex role play and consensual non consent, this is something that is just perhaps being accommodated in robotic form. So this could just be another form of sexual role play where no one is being harmed because there isn't a person to be harmed. So if something cannot give its consent because it's not a person, therefore, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, people do play with subordination and domination roles in sexual interactions, we think that's okay, but that's usually because we think there's some way of cancelling any problematic interpretation of it. That, you know, there are safe words that allow yeah. people to opt out. In the case of a robot, you know, my view is that you could probably program a robot or you should think about programming a robot so that it apply or uses the same norms of consent that we apply to normal sexual interactions. So you could play around with the subordination, domination role, but as long as there's some signaling of consent, that would be better. Do you think it is Surely not the fact that it's a machine, not consent. Is that not enough of a... So, I mean, like, I don't necessarily think you're wronging the robot. It's not like a wrong that's performed to the robot, but I think it's possibly it's preferable to have a robot that adheres to our norms of consent. So, um, Sergi Santos's robot, Samantha, he has trying to build in that you have to sort of build up to, to, to having sex with her. You've got to stroke her and touch her. And the idea is eventually you will give this robot an orgasm. And that therefore the sort of, it's a consensual act in that as well. Um, which I actually think is, is, is a very sort of well-intentioned thing to uh, approach to taking it. Maybe one approach, although to be honest, I favor again, favor moving away from these human human like forms. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More than that later. I should say just one thing is that I don't know him personally, but, um, he has been, I think, portrayed in an incredibly negative way in the media as this really sad and pathetic individual. But uh, people who have met him, so one of my <laughs> co-authors in the book said he's actually, he seems very well-intentioned, very honest, yes. a very nice guy. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I'm really impressed, actually, by um, by his work because he's very con he's, he's considered this a lot and he's put a lot of thought into what he's doing. So, yeah, I'm, yeah. I and I think if you read any, you know, Daily Mail or tabloid headlines about him, I would be extremely suspicious about whether they're accurately capturing yeah. his ideas based on my own negative experiences with tabloid press. Yes, I would agree as well. This is something that gets um, a lot of media attention and not all of it. Well, some of it is reported quite accurately. So we ran the Love and Sex with Robots conference at Goldsmiths in 2016. And I would say that, you know, at least 60%, 70% of the stories were well reported, but with some sensationalist headlines but then there were the completely tabloidy very exaggerated stories about us all being fucked to death um which actually came out of a, a reasonable paper by oliver bandel is basically saying the threat from ai is not the evil super intelligent robot it's that we're programming it badly and they don't know when to stop which is you know, yeah kind of it's the futurama it? argument yeah, against yeah. Uh, sexual <laughs> so. uh, futurama are way ahead of us on this by the way they've they've, they've been considering this for years um so moving beyond sex, can you love a robot? Well, I mean, here you encounter the same arguments that we had when it came to can you have sex with a robot. Um, so there are probably like three major objections to the notion that you can have a loving or intimate relationship with a robot. One is that in order to have a loving relationship with somebody, th there needs to be some element of reciprocity or mutuality. Um, so it's one of the chapters in the, the book puts this kind of nicely. It says that... Um, Love is not having a loving relationship with somebody is not just purely a matter of how they behave towards you, because if it was purely a matter of behavior, you could hire an actor to be your lover, but that wouldn't be a meaningful relationship because they're just going through the motions. And the analogy then is that a, a sex robot or a, an intimate companion robot would be going through the motions, just following a certain set of behavioral patterns. Um, the other, so that's the mutuality idea that I need, there needs to be something going on behind the eyes of the robot, so to speak, some uh, re reciprocation of affection. The other concern that people have is that in order to have a loving relationship with someone, you need, they need to freely choose you. Uh, it's not just enough that they feel something for you. It must be a freely chosen commitment. And people argue, well, that sex robots or intimate companion robots will be programmed to love you so they won't be able to satisfy that free choice condition and then the other concern is that well setting those two issues to the side 
there is a fear that people will be manipulated into thinking that they are having a loving relationship with the robot because we do often depend on these behavioral signals to determine whether we are in a meaningful relationship with somebody. So there's a huge potential for deception and kind of corporate or commercial exploitation of people in these settings. And there's a lot of concern in this regard around the use of companion robots in elder care yeah. facilities with people with yeah. cognitive impairments that they will be easily deceived by this technology. So there are at least those three objections to the notion of having a loving and intimate relationship with a robot. That sort of hinges on the idea of relationship here. Do you think it's possible? I mean, people are in love with other people all the time and don't get love back. So, you know, they, they, they feel this intense longing. Do you think they could love a robot and not be in a relationship with it? Do you think those feelings could be genuine? Yeah, I mean, even though I set out the <laughs> argument, the objection to it, I don't necessarily agree with it. So, I mean, I think it's possible for people to have very strong asymmetrical bonds or effect, uh, feelings of affection towards another person. Unrequited love is a common theme in literature, so I don't doubt that you yeah. could have something similar towards a robot. Um, and also, I, I, like, I'm doubtful of the philosophical case against meaningful, intimate relationships with robots just because I think philosophers depend on certain ideas that it's almost impossible to prove in practice. So having been in a long-term relationship with somebody, it's pretty hard for me to know what she's really thinking or whether she feels the exact same way about me as I feel about her beyond her behaviors towards me. But I mean, that's the only epistemic grounding, the only thing I can latch on to when it comes to being a firm believer in whether I'm in a intimate relationship. And I think people will end up in the same position when it comes to that, robots. You can say that about lots of aspects of robotics as well, even consciousness. You don't really... Yeah, so I... That, so <laughs> I think that's... Thing. I think I like a lot... Of, so the debate about consciousness is interesting to some extent, but again, I think there's problems about how would you actually prove it. We don't know exactly what material or functional patterns in the human brain instantiate consciousness. There's a lot of uncertainty about that. Some people think you don't need the brain at all for consciousness. So um, I think we'll end up in a similar position when it comes to our relationships with, with robots. And in, in this respect, I am an orthodox Turingist that I think that w once they can pass as being human, like those questions about consciousness will remain and linger, but they'll be met less meaningful because people will just have to go with how things appear to them. I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you on that. I think that we already, I mean, there's been plenty of research that shows that every single interaction with technology and computers that we have is a social act. Um, Clifford Nuss's work on this and the idea of computers as social actors um, says that we, because we engage with each other in a social way, then we just transfer that immediately onto the machine. Um, and there's, pre there's plenty of, of um, examples of that, which is, and, it, and it, it goes right down to even just interacting with a with the desktop computer. It doesn't even have to be a, a robot. Of course, the the thing that you, you, you've mentioned in the book as well is that this, this embodied aspect makes it um, much more compelling because we have a figure that is situated in the world. But I just want to kind of come away from that and think, you know, the, vir the idea of the virtual as well, um, and the idea of films like Her, where someone falls in love with an operating system. Mm. Um, do you think there has to be a situated body, there has to be embodiment in order for a relationship to occur? No, I mean, uh, you can have relationships with people that you don't have any physical interaction with them. I mean, there are lots of my colleagues in academia I've never physically met and I talk to them on a regular basis and I think I have some kind of friendship or interaction with them and I think that idea has become more normalized with the use of the internet. Um, there are also reports of people having what seem like quite touching intimate relationships with operating systems already. Uh, I can't remember her name but is a New York Times columnist or journalist who wrote a book called To Siri With Love, which is about the relationship between her autistic son and Siri. And she, she argued that it was a very useful and helpful relationship for her as a mother because her son could be quite demanding and relentless at sometimes and she might lose her patience with him. But the thing about Siri is that Siri was always unfailingly patient with her son, would always answer any questions that he had. So he had some obsession with weather and looked for weather reports all the time. And Siri would provide him with all the weather reports he possibly wanted. So she argued that it actually was beneficial in the relationship between herself and her son to have this third-party companion that could maybe 
outsource some of the emotional labor associated with the relationship. I think that's quite a, quite a compelling idea. I mean, we already... We, we are social creatures and there's a habit of, you know, putting on the radio when you're in the house so you can hear other voices and things like that. And I think people do chat to their digital virtual assistants as if they're, as if they're people when there's no need to do that. I mean, you can, if you want to know the weather from Alexa, you can, people will say, Alexa, what's the weather in London today? When they could just say, Alexa, weather London. Um, but we do have this urge to talk in a, in a kind of a conversational tone. It's a very natural form for us. And that's often the end goal of developers and designers is to make it as natural and human-like as possible because that's the most user-friendly kind of interaction. And now I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, cause, so so um, my own thoughts on, on the form of these is that we see two very clear paths. We see a path where, of sex toy development and we see a path of sex doll development. And the sex robots are coming out of that sex doll path. Whereas when we look at sex toys, we see disembodied, discrete, well, not disembodied, but discrete body parts usually. But they've, gone, they've undergone a design revolution that's come out of, actually come out of um, a lot of modesty and um, trying to avoid obscenity by making them more abstract. Um, but we've seen this move from an engineering phase to a design phase in sex toys that we have not yet seen in sex robots, where the idea is to model as closely as possible the human rather than looking at other forms. Um, my own thoughts or hopes is that we move to more embodied, larger scale, immersive or seductive or sensuous sex toys that can operate with a degree of autonomy like a robot and also interact and take information and feed it back to us. Um, do you think that counts as a sex robot? <laughs> I'm going to ask you first of all. <laughs> I think I would ask you for maybe a more detailed description okay. of what, 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 what you're imagining. But, um, okay, sex yeah. duvet. Um, <laughs> no, um, it, it could be anything. I mean, we ran this sex tech hackathon at Goldsmiths for two years now, and this year we saw a lot of immersive sort of things. And one of them was a, um, a sensual hammock where you would lie um, with these tubes wrapped around you and it, it, they would pump up with air and they would squeeze you and hug you. And you could imagine this kind of extrapolating into, you know, you, you could pick whatever you wanted if you wanted a bed made of breasts or you wanted, uh, you know, um, a cushion that uh, vibrated that was like full body shape and things like that. So you know, responsive technology that can touch you back. Um, I mean, to me, that seems a way of getting out of this whole very gendered um objectively objectified form and into something more interesting and also from a practical point of view it's much easier to store in your house <laughs> um so you know do you do you see do you think that the sex robots will go down this humanoid route do you think we have to have a humanoid form to to engage with it? Do they have to have a humanoid form too for us to engage with them? I mean, I don't think we have to have a humanoid form. And I think the kind of project that you're envis envisioning seems like a very interesting and progressive idea to me insofar as it's moving beyond the constraints of biological form and, and actually being more imaginative about what, is, what types of sexual experience are possible with technology, that it doesn't have to be this uh, embodied, biologicized, anatomical interaction. So it seems like it could be a very fruitful project or idea, I suspect there will still be a strong attraction to the humanoid-like shape and form just for Habits. biological reasons, millions evolutionary reasons. Habit. Yes. <laughs> I think it's hard to, it be hard to overcome millions of years of habit. But I think I, I like the idea of freeing it from the humanoid form. Whether it counts as a, a robot, well, yeah, probably. I mean, an embodied artificial agent of some kind it doesn't have to be human, humanoid or human-like in shape or form. Good, I'll, I'll keep going with that then. <laughs> um, keep up the good work. Keep up the good work, yeah. Um, so thinking about this, um, I think, you know, what do you see as being, do you, David Levy's work, he has us all, uh, and, and, and I, I like some, David's done some really lovely stuff, but he has us all marrying robots by 2025. Do you think that's ever going to happen at all, let alone in 2025? Um, I, I don't think so. I mean, partly because I, I don't know what the impact of sex technology would be on the future of marriage. I mean, marriage is also something that's a social construct and yeah. is likely to undergo shifts. We have a whole chapter in the book about that, um, which suggests that marriage will undergo some radical changes as a result of the, the wide distribution or availability of various forms of sex technology, but sex robotics in particular, um, kind of towards non -monogamy, normalizing non-monogamy, <laughs> Uh, changing what a marriage is about away from 
a sexualized procreative ideal of marriage to something that's more about companionship. Um, I also, I, like, I hate making any sorts of predictions. Oh, about, yeah, I know. It comes back to haunt you. <laughs> yeah. Like, you can find headlines online where it's stated that I think that sex robots will take over in 2025, even though, I, like, I never said that. Um, I, the only reason that comes up is because I happen to quote David Levy in a paper and people associate his view with mine. So, um, yeah. I think there's no, there's no, certainly from an academic perspective, there's no credibility um, in making these firm predictions about I, I, when... I absolutely agree. That's why I try to dodge that question every single time it's asked. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we are, we, we are on the edge of something. I mean, like saying like three, four years ago, this was not being taken all that seriously. What was the initial reaction when you started working in this area? Did, did people kind of raise an eyebrow and go, what, what are you doing, what? Yeah, I mean, then they still do. Um, yeah, same. <laughs> My, my mother is incredibly disappointed in me. It's an Irish mummy thing. <laughs> All those years of education, <laughs> and this is the end result. Um, you didn't dedicate the book to her? <laughs> I, no, I, I did not. <laughs> I dedicate, dedicated it to my, uh, my partner, Aoife. So, but I think they have a comment in there about how patient she was in putting up with my unusual research interest. But actually, she, she loves it. She loves telling people that I research sex robots because it's an instant conversation generator. My, mo my mother's the same. It's a source of great pride and yet great disappointment. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my colleagues at work definitely are incredibly uncomfortable about discussing it. I mean, several of them. And they just think it's weird that this is a thing that I do. Um, and, you know, at times I agree with them. It is a bit weird. It is. And yet fascinating because... It just it encompasses so much interesting stuff about being human, I think. And that's, at the end of the day, that's, that's the fascinating thing. Yeah, I mean, and also from a very cold instrumentalist perspective, there was value in kind of going into an, an area that people were reluctant to talk about in a serious way. Yeah. So I, that was well, one of my goals when I first started into this, was to kind of bring some, some of the insights from philosophy of sex and criminal law and theory and sex to the debate about sex robots. I think I find that as well. I think when I, I wrote an article a few years ago that went viral and initially when it was um, it was picked up by I fucking love science on Facebook and, and um, people were going, why would an academic research something like this? But yet within three comments had gone, but that might be useful for some people, but they might like that. But what if it was a child? And you're like, yes, that's that's the thing. I think when once people start looking at the the ideas behind it they quite quickly see what the the ethical dilemmas are and, and yeah if you can get past the kind of yuck factor response yeah. or kind of disgust response and get them to you know, read even the first few paragraphs of what you've written and they see that oh this is actually something that's worth taking seriously or thinking about seriously but it is quite difficult to do that in the age of clickbait media yeah. and certainly my uh, interactions with online media in this er space have been Disappointing. Some people have written very good stuff uh, about it, but others less, much less so. Yeah. No, I've seen some. I've seen some really good ones. I've seen some. Yeah. I, I the Daily Mail put a picture of a sex robot on their website and captioned it with my name. <laughs> so I'm not on the Daily Kate Mail Devlin, website. Yeah, yeah, I am not on the Daily Mail website as a sex robot, which is uh, yeah, actually I mean, like, one of the highlights of my career. <laughs> in my like in my university or in my sc school within my university, I my reputation oh. doesn't extend beyond the bounds of the school that I'm in, really. Um, I'm known as the sex robot guy. So I was wondering what, like, your experience is like. Is it, are you, are you known woman. as the... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the short yeah. end. Yeah. <laughs> it's great at parties, but, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, thank you. I want to open it up to the floor. So if anyone has got questions or comments, immediately there is a, a question. Um, is there a microphone going around there? <laughs> So, so we, we give up, we've got money on which one of you is the sex robot, and it'd be nice of you to answer. Um, well, it's the more abstract one. Um. <laughs> this is a robot. <laughs> it's a vibrating pleasure globe. If I was a robot, would I be able to drink wine? I think not. Mm. We get asked that a lot, actually. Well, I get asked that a lot. Um, are you a sex robot? Well, no, I mean, the question I get asked most often by journalists is, do you have a sex robot? And if so, oh, could, can you, we see it? could you share any pictures of it for, with us, please? Brian Appleyard as well asked oh, me yeah, yeah, whether, yeah. I, um, whether I had ever had sex with a robot, to which I responded, uh, it's none of your business. <laughs> no, I, 
Yes. <laughs> However, if you if you do want to talk to people, actually, um, Sarji will talk quite openly about having sex with his robot um, and uh, with, uh, with his wife's blessing, and he's really open and candid about it, and it's quite interesting. Hi. Um, ethically, or I suppose sort of psychologically, what do you think of the idea that you know if a fantasy can sometimes potentially be stronger than the enactment of that fantasy itself, and so in providing a sort of safe space for someone to reenact, say, a rape fantasy or something, and them then doing it would allow them to kind of realize that it's not something they want or, or anything. What, what's, what sort of impact does that have? Or, what, or how do you think robotics are kind of helping going down that route? I, like, I just think we don't really know um, whether it helps or benefits. So, I mean, people make that style of argument that it sounds maybe superficially plausible that it provides a safe outlet for... Pro otherwise problematic desires or fantasies. Um, my understanding of the psychological literature in other areas about you know aggression or violence is that it's not always helpful to encourage people to act out aggressive fantasies, that it has an emboldening effect on them. It, it uh, kind of habituates them to a certain style of behavior. But again, when it comes to rape fantasies and sex robots, I, like, I, I have no idea what the empirical consequences of it are. There's no research that I know of that's been done on that question. Um, but I would be skeptical about it having a, a positive impact. Hi, uh, my name is Nika and I'm part of the campaign against sex robots. That's Kate, she's also part of this campaign. We have more people, because we only have Kathleen's name. So you're both in no, the No, well. the names okay. are on the website, so uh, it's not... I guess the research sometimes must be a bit more comprehensive. I'm not sure. Um, I first, I had, I have some comments because there's a whole chapter devoted to the campaign, and I think it's obviously campaign has a lot of traction. Um, firstly, I think there's a difference between being an activist and an academic. And if you, when you analyze a campaign, I guess you should not use formal logic to do that, and to use like uh, formal arguments to see. What it, and like, for example, um, you analyze in the chapter one article, whereas campaign is much more than about one article. So I have some problems <laughs> with this chapter. But in order to understand more, if so that the, the voice about the campaign doesn't get like um, so simplified, let's say. Um, Basically, the campaign is about different things. We are different. We are not. I'm a kind of academic. Kate is an artist. So, like, we are not. Uh, we're not. We don't have the same message. And we also believe that the ban. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough uh, influence in society. That we don't have the pretense that we can like change the world in such a big way that there will be a whole wor world worldwide ban on sex robots. But. Um, I think it's an interesting comparison that you make between the um, campaign of, uh, about stop killing robots, because like um, it's obvious that in the society it's, there are certain wars that are being considered more important than others, and we are a feminist campaign and we um, we live sexism and we every day there's a war waged against women as well. So I believe sometimes that making arguments like, oh, there, is one, there are wars that are more important than others, there are people who are being killed, symbolic violence is less important than different violences. Like, I believe that um, what is symptomatic in your argument is that it's being written by, I think, three guys, and this is, it happens very often, that there are guys writing about um, campaigners against sex robots being like um, too focused on issues that are non-issues, whereas I think that there are quite some issues about it. And if we talk about prostitution, uh, the campaign against sex robots is for the Nordic model that decriminalizes, that criminalizes the buyers and decriminalizes the sex workers or prostitutes. It's a very complicated issue. We do not say this is like something that you can have a campaign that is like written in five five paragraphs, it's always complicated to talk issues about issues like that, but we believe that sex robots have, are a symptom of a consumer society that went to somehow to a certain extent to an excess. And uh, we have different um, focuses. I focus on racism and I focus on the problematics of how data is being used in those applications. Um, in 
the development is in AI is currently going more into the direction of emotional artificial intelligence. So can we just get to your question and thought if you don't mind. So just so we can free up the discussion. Okay, for maybe others. I'm sorry. I just wanted because you know there's a whole chapter written about a campaign and this that is being misrepresented. So I thought I could maybe have some more words about if, it. If you have a specific question, that would be great. My question would be made the thing that I said at the beginning. Um, do you think it makes sense to um, analyze or like criticize campaigns, so like activism, in the same way as you criticize academic papers? Um, so, I mean, the, the chapter was written two years ago, just after the um, launch of the campaign, and when there was only one paper that I was aware of, the asymmetrical relationship that uh, Kathleen Richardson had written, which was purportedly an academic paper. So we scrutinized it in the same terms that we would apply to any academic paper. Um, and we used a kind of informal logic to analyze the, the case that was being made, which seemed to be based on this analogy between prostitution and um, sex robots. So, I mean, I would stand by the views within that paper. I'm sure that more literature has been added and there's been more refinement and nuance to the campaign since it was published. Academic books take a very long time to produce. Um, yeah, th this manuscript was finished in early 2016 and wasn't published by the publisher until 2017. I would be happy to engage with future, uh, any future contributions that develop the arguments. But I, I mean, I still stand by the notion that the understanding or interpretation of prostitution within that paper is something that is highly contested within the academic literature and, the, and the also amongst activists of sex work. So, and amongst, and amongst sex, yeah. So, I, I, like, I think it presents a very one-sided view or understanding of sex work um, that is not shared by many people that I have discussed this topic with. We are three guys writing the paper. Um, sorry about that. Anyone else? Hi. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm interested in the ideas that are in the second chapter of the book, which is about um, whether sex with a robot is actually possible, because uh, wh whether you can actually have sex with some thing rather than someone. And the idea, essentially, in the, that chapter of the book you mentioned before, is that um, the, the, the authors there say that they don't think it's possible because you need agency on both sides for there to be uh, for there to be what they would want to call sex going on um, I, I'd be interested in the idea that actually sex happens when there is kind of generativity in a relationship when when some kind of social good is formed and I wonder whether that is possible <clears throat> between a human being and a robot whether uh, whether social good can happen in a sexual relationship between a human, human being and a robot. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I don't know if I fully follow that. So generativity, the generation of some kind of social good or... Yeah. Um, such as? Uh, such as the building of a, of a, a relationship uh, or of a partnership that strengthens a kind of a bond within the community. Yeah, so I mean, that would then kind of go into issues around um, relational goods and the issue whether you can have a relationship with a, a robot. Um, I mean, there are other kinds of social goods that I could imagine arising from this. Uh, there's another paper in the book about you know the distribution of sexual pleasure and sex rights. Uh, there's a couple of papers on that that argue that you you could have certain social goods such as a wider distribution of sexual pleasure than we currently have through the use of, of robots. That would be a kind of social good. I suppose the point is that uh, it's... I suppose the point is that sex with a robot has a, uh, creates a very individualistic understanding of what sexual yeah, pleasure sure, is. Yeah. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> no, well, no, I, th I think... <laughs> it's, it's great, but it might be better. No, I, I, great. I, I see your point. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I think there, the there are two, two things I would say then. Um... One is that I, I agree that there's a problematically individualistic assumption underlying a lot of um, fascination or fixation on, on sex robots. Um, there may be a slight kind of immaturity to our under understanding of relationships that as, you know, as children we have asymmetrical relationships with toys or fictional beings and maybe this is just a, a 
prolonging of this childhood for childish form of relationship. That is a common critique of sex robots that they don't encourage you to mature into this more mutualistic and recipro uh, okay, reciprocity-based understanding of relationships. Oh, I just want to jump in as the kind of deviant in the room going, why do you have to have that? <laughs> I mean, why can't you just be, why can't it just be sex for the sake of, of pleasure and fun? Does yeah, it have to be? It doesn't have to be a relationship. Yeah, so I think that um, this crops up in other debates as well about whether you can have friend friendships with robots. And I think that um, people often focus on an idealistic or ideal form of relationship or interaction. So when it comes to friendship, people always discuss, you know, this virtue style friendship that Aristotle used to discuss, which involves a sharing of life and, cons and concern for the other as an end in themselves. And uh, you, know, you, but you can have other kinds of friendship that are just about pleasure, just about utility. And it doesn't seem to me that they're necessarily enemies of that other style of relationship, that you can't have both things. So I think that's your point yeah, about sexual interactions, that you can have just casual, pleasurable yeah. sex. You don't need this significant bond with another person. So, yeah. Well, I, I, I think maybe like in an ideal world, we would have accessibility of both. Yeah. Hi. I'm sorry. Got a cold. Um, <clears throat> do you believe in the notion of um, someone losing their virginity to uh, sex robot? Do you think that's possible? I, I don't believe in the notion of virginity at all. I think it's a, it's a construct, but perhaps, you know. <laughs> No, I mean, I, like I would have a similar view, but I think, again, this why this goes to why the, the debate about whether you can have sex with a robot will be culturally significant is that some people do yeah. think virginity is an important concept and uh, rest a lot of weight on it. Um, you know, if you have a highly biologized understanding of virginity, then I you guess probably it, could. Yeah, it's kind of knowing, you know, what, what constitutes sex? Does it have to involve a penis and a vagina? If it does, then perhaps is there a virginity involved in that intersection of the two? Or, you know, what happens if you are in a same-sex relationship where you never see a vagina or never see a penis because you're in, you know, how, how do you, what does virginity count as then? I think there's that, there's that very narrow, certainly Western view of what that means. And, and so I find that a little bit problematic. Um, but yeah, I think it, you know, it, my preferred view would be that maybe we just abandon any notion of, of virginity or any understanding of that. But um, if we want to keep it, it would be something that is largely self-defined or self-determined, like how how significant a sexual experience did you think it was? And I think that's an interesting thing, actually, about the whole the whole thing. Really, is about you know when it comes to relationships and you know what it, it, everybody has such individual ideas about what they want and what they they have in a relationship i think um noel sharkey a few years ago was quoted as saying he was worried about um children losing their virginity to their parents sex robots uh, he, which he then said later was completely and agreed it was completely taken out of context at a, at a, as a throwaway comment at a science festival um what freaked me out about that was the idea from getting hold of the parents sex robot more than anything but it is that that kind of you know what we, we have to negotiate what it means individually, I think, in terms of what that means to us uh, for our own values. Yeah. I have a question for Kate, actually. Um, and I, I just want to make sure I'm characterizing your construction of the difference between sex robots and the sex toy derived phylum, if I can, yeah. properly. That you, you, would it be correct to say that you think that there's something more spacious or more interesting about things that aren't strictly on the, the humanoid body form and that... There's yeah. more possibility. I think there's much more possibility. We have amazing text, you know, textiles, materials, plastics, soft robotics that we could do much more interesting things with. I, I would tend to share that assumption, but I just wanted to follow up because I think that the, our cultural imaginary about sexuality is still determined largely inside a patriarchal, misogynist culture. Yes. To me, <laughs> a pillow that's made out of breast doesn't necessarily have the escape velocity. To oh, yeah, get yeah. Beyond. No, that's, that's okay. just a throwaway example. Okay. My, my pillow wouldn't necessarily have all those breasts. It would have other bits too. So, um, But you do see a more hopeful direction. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot more that that could be done there. And I think what the interest, my interest in sort of the style of sex toys, so the reason we saw the um, the rabbit vibrator, for example, come out in, um, in sort of late 90s, early 2000s, um, was actually because there was a, uh, in Japan, you weren't allowed to produce anatomically correct sex toys. And so they, they were made, made it cute and multicolored and put bits on it. And that actually led to a big design evolution um, and much, much more interesting sex toys. So the ones we see today, you could, you know, put 
on your mantelpiece. I, I, I have plenty of them in my mantelpiece in work. <laughs> um, you know, you put these up and they, they just look quite beautiful. And, and you think, you know, these, um, if we're doing that with the toys, why aren't we doing that with fuller, more embodied things as well? I think just the potential there is really big. Yeah, it's possible that the equipment that was bequeathed to us by evolution is not <laughs> we sexually optimized. optimal. Yeah, yeah. It's not optimized. <laughs> I'm going to optimize the penis um, and other things. Yeah. Uh, but I think that also gives it a chance to move it away from this incredibly heteronormative and misogynistic stance as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I also just want to add, because I don't want to be dismissive of the campaign against sex robots. I have certain issues with the way in which the uh, argument was presented initially in favor of that. But like, I do think there are lots of legitimate concerns about the representation of women in yeah, I agree. Um, sex dolls not just sex robots. I agree, although I think my own stance on the sex dolls is that this is such a, a small community that have found a lot of happiness from it, um, but not in, and, and that, that, that idea of increased enacted violence coming from a sex doll culture just isn't playing out. I haven't seen it. But it was one of the things is that I'm writing a paper about this in the moment is that I think that um, interest in the, or the objection to the misogynistic representation in sex dolls and sex robots um, could learn a lot, I think, from the history of the feminist porn movement. And the feminist porn response to pornography was, was not that we should ban it or prohibit it, but that we should make better forms of it. And I think that's a, a better lesson to learn from the history of the porn wars. It's interesting. I could quite happily sit actually and chat about this, but it's probably not the right venue for that because I've got some issues around that as well. And I think that there's a lot of underreporting of what women are actually watching in porn. Um, but I agree there's been some really good stuff like Erica Lust's work and things like that that have, have taken that and made the space for themselves in it, which is, which is quite interesting. Well, I mean, just briefly, it's about like, it's about the content of the way the imagery, but also more importantly, I think about the processes through which this is yeah. created and the context in which it is consumed. Mm -hmm. Because again, there isn't. I think there's no single understanding of female or male sexual desires, that, and we need to get away from that assumption that there are certain things that men like and certain things that women like. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of reporting is, and a lot of reactions are done on a on a, like a personal moralistic basis a lot of the time without going into the actual looking at where the, the evidence harm is. And I think we need to be cautious that we're not Im immediately doing a knee jerk reaction to these kind of things. Yep. So is there a scenario in which in the future, humans say uh, spend less and less time trying to have relationships with each other because the relationships they can have with uh, robots are much more fulfilling, much more stimulating, much more endearing and therefore we'll end up being uh, more I isolated and uh, singular. And is that something to fear or something perhaps to, that you're not worried about? I think it's already suggested sometimes people in Japan are moving to increasingly sexless society, in part because real human relationships is, are hard work, and if they can have relationships in a fantasy world instead, then maybe that's a sign of things to come. Well, conveniently, John has produced today an article that touches on things like this about human relationships, um, which is out on Aeon and uh, available from, yeah, now. You can look so, it up uh, right now, called, yeah. called Embracing the Robot. So, uh, you yeah, I used an example in that of a device called Azuma, Azuma Hikari, or maybe it's the other way around, which is a holographic intimate companion that is marketed towards um, young Japanese men. I, I have a lot of thoughts about this, but uh, most of them come from my discussions with a guy called Dan White, who's an anthropologist who's worked in Japan for about 15 years. And he thinks that there's a lot of Western misrepresentation about the sexless nature of Japanese society, and that that's overreported and misunderstood. But more importantly, he thinks, why is it that young Japanese people are not having sex or having families or not interested in intimacy, allegedly. Well, a lot of it has to do with deeper kind of socioeconomic reasons. The cost of having a family, the cost of childcare, the cost of property in Japan is astronomical. If we address those concerns, I think they would be much more fruitful or useful ways of addressing concerns about this isolationism and retreat from human interactions. Um, I, you know, I think there could be concerns about that, but I think there are better ways to address them.
I, my my own view is that I'm I'm a techno optimist, I must say, um, and I see that there are some things that really concern me about the way technology is going. One of them is the recent deep fakes thing, um, it's machine learning gone bad. But I think in terms of isolation, we are seeing we we have this um, propensity to worry about with every technological change to worry about isolation, and yet more often than not, we're left with with good benefits that bring us closer together. And in terms of things like the smartphones that we're going to destroy social interaction, we've actually, I'm able to, my parents are able to see their grandchild grow up even though they live in a different country and talk you know, via video. And I can stay in touch with loved ones all over the world at any time. And I think there's that sort of trade-off. I think we're fairly good at mediating that. I'm pretty optimistic about humans' ability to mediate that technology. I think there's always outliers, but by and large, we're, we're okay with it. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I'm a little bit more pessimistic about the uh, effects of social media on our relationships. But in general, there's this interesting, um, I think Stephen Pinker has this in his recent book, but the optimism gap that a lot of people, when you ask them about their own lives, are very optimistic and enthusiastic about things. But when they think about how society in general is going, it's all going to hell. And I, I suppose actually that is sort of my view of social media as well, that I my experience with it is quite positive or the internet more generally is more positive that it does bring me closer to people who I would otherwise never have an opportunity to have a relationship with or a cons an ongoing relationship with. But when I look more generally at society, I think it's all fairly dismal and dystopian. And yet, and we're living in one of the sort of safest times possible with the best quality of life ever. But yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, there is that. Uh, I mean, that could be a bias that affects our conversations about this as well. I think it's all, well, it's all, yeah, yeah, certainly. Yes. I'm just thinking, I'm always looking at tech for good and also very positive about tech, but um, has there been any research done about how sex robots can maybe be used for education, with sex education for teens? It's been suggested. I've seen it suggested. Um, was there anything particular that you've come across? I don't think there's a huge amount of research on this at all, and yeah. I think there are problems with even getting fun yeah. Yeah, funding to do those kinds of research studies. But there, I did an event this morning in the Oxford Literary Festival about this book as well, and there was a sex therapist at it who was talking about how he treats teenage boys in particular and how they've been ruined or wrecked by pornography. That's it, his statement on it. Um, and I suggest, well, there could be, you could view sex robots as a continuation of the pornified culture, but actually you could be more optimistic about it that, you know, at least when it comes to sex robots, there's some attempt to have a mutual interaction or a conversation or what Sergio, Sergio Santos is trying to do with you know, foreplay in yeah. robotic form. So it could be, it could be used as a ther uh, not a therapeutic tool, but uh, an educational tool, a sex ed tool. And that would be, again, a more progressive and positive vision of this technology and something that I think people should consider or invest in time in. Although I have this vision of like the, the resuscitation dolls that they have. <laughs> <laughs> kind of weird, this is the torsos. You know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Kind of, okay. um, but you want them to be non anthropomorphic? Yeah, so <laughs> I just have like, yeah. Uh, some weird a breast pillow. Breast pillow. Yeah. I, th this was just an example off the top of my head. Other, you, your mileage may vary. Other forms are available. Take well, that, a pick. That's the headline. I get what I yeah. normally do. I, <laughs> <laughs> I normally get people to to do design exercises around it, and we do the games where people trying to pick what they would like. In actually, the actually, Kate, uh, I did have a question exactly of that. Um, oh, okay. Is there not a, an erotic anthology of alternative body forms yet available? And not if yet. not, why can you it. it? Working on it. <laughs> There's a question up here. Um, right, I, what you were saying about the, um, I think it's very superficial and, and I get the pleasure thing, but I think everything's energy and there's no energy, there's no energy, there's no spirit having a relationship with a sex robot. But what if you didn't have the relationship? I'm thinking of it in terms of more a sort of sex toy thing. Yeah, the sex toy thing I get, but when you when we're saying can you love one and have a, oh, okay. and have right, a right. relation, like a meaningful there's no energy, so doesn't that mean people end up because it's basically dead? Uh, yeah, I mean, my my kind of um, analogy there is a little bit along the lines of you know why do people keep cats because they don't often give you a lot. Yeah, but well, they've got energy. They're, wa they're warm. <laughs> they're warm, and they. Well, you can make one that's warm. You can make one that's warm and that responds. Yeah, but there's no you. energy. You know, but everything's I, 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 energy, I isn't it? <laughs> I don't know because I mean, you know, you can you can people's. Oh, and, and that has been discussed, people's relationship. David Levy goes into that about the relationship with pets. And actually, Matt McMullen, who makes the real dolls, has said, you know, he sees it as a sort of a pet. So 
sort of feature. So it's not fully human, but it has this kind of animation in a way, an animacy. I mean, uh, two points I would make is that one, this is a very interesting philosophical question about, you know, whether a robot can have some kind of inner life or spirit. Depends on what you mean by that or what you, or energy. I think it seems to me technologically feasible to create one that ha that certainly mimics a lot of the things that you look for in terms of energy and um, reciprocation and spirit. So the outward signs can yeah. be there. Yeah, so the outward signs can be there. And, there, you know, there are... Uh, techno um, technologists developing things with, that have you know skin-like sensation with warmth and that it feels like a more like a real human being. But the other point I think that ties into your project around the non-anthropomorphic view is that we shouldn't necessarily view these things that that people use in substitute for a human partner, but actually that's something that's used to complement yeah um, a human sexual relationship in the same way that people use sex toys at the moment as part of a sexual interaction with another yeah, human being. I think, yeah, I think that's sort of, he summed it up better than me. <laughs> Anyone else? Time for a final question? Yeah, final question? When do you think we hit the critical point where the sex technology is actually good enough? The sex singularity. The sex yeah, singularity. The sex singularity. <laughs> I don't know, October 13th, 20, <laughs> 2034. That's, what, are the, so what are the defining characteristics? <laughs> um, you know, like the internet, the defining characteristic for me was being able to send an email from your phone completely changed the way that you can communicate. I mean, we haven't actually talked about this much, but I think um, virtual sexual interactions are possibly mm. the point where it'll become most realistic. So and they're that, happening. Yeah, like the combination of VR with haptic technology yeah. will maybe, it'll be like your experience with sending an email, only um, and we're, we're pretty much different. there with that. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> uh, we're, we're pretty much getting there with the teledonics. I think the problem there is just that VR is still a bit pants. Um, <laughs> uh, I saw the first wave of VR and thought that's not going to work. And then I saw the second wave of VR and went, that's still not going to work. Um, but I think we are getting there. I mean, already we've got smart sex toys that can be connected online and are being used in things like uh, calm sex work um, so that people are having those experiences in different locations. Um, and we've had, we, there's a wonderful group of people working on this in terms of privacy security, in terms of development. Um, and I think that that is something that will become more and more prevalent. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's definitely, and, and if you think about it, you can have, um, you can meet someone online. I mean, it's, it's perfectly standard nowadays to meet someone online, uh, meet someone online, you get talking to them online, they send you a picture. You don't know if that's really them, but let's presume that the picture they sent you is probably of them. I've had deep fakes. Oh, yeah, deep fakes. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been on dates where the person who turned up was not the person in the picture. Um, so you take it, let's take it that it is that person. And then you form a bond with them and it's quite easy to form an intense bond with someone online. Um, so you establish a relationship. You have sex with them virtually over the internet through VR perhaps. Um, and all this while, you don't really know what the real person is like that might be a Russian bot, you never know. Um, it, 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 but it could be feasible, it could be. And with deep fakes and things like that, where someone else's face can be put on footage of, you know, and create fake news instantly, we might already be there. We might already be having relationships with, with bots. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's not that. Shall, I it's already say, happened, yeah, but you just don't realise. I want to say thank you to uh, Library London for hosting us. And books can be purchased at the back. Is that the case, Luke? Can books be purchased at the back? I look all those notes in there. I've been made good, good use of this book. Um, my book is not for sale yet because it's not out till September, but you can pre-order it. That's a plug, plug. It's called Turned On. Um, <laughs> genuinely. Um, and I, <laughs> thank you to our volunteers for helping to film tonight's event. And I want to end with this. The future is always virtual and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction. And though sometimes, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything that it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that today. Please join me in thanking the incredible John Danaher. <laughs> <laughs>